most unforgettable rendition of happy birthday that anyone has ever heard. Wearing a skin-tight, flesh-colored gown her designer had literally sewn her into just moments before, Monroe sang to John F. Kennedy at a star-studded Democratic Party fundraiser in New York City, 10 days before the president's 45th birthday. I got a telegram tonight which said, uh, in honor of your birthday, I believe that you should get uh, a rise in pay. Signed, uh, Roger. And then it said, P.S., my birthday's next month. So, but we're grateful to them, to Bobby Darren, and to Miss Carol, who was going to come, and to Miss Monroe left a picture to come all the way east and I can now retire from politics after having had a happy birthday sung to me in such a sweet <laughs> Rumors have persisted ever since the deaths of Marilyn Monroe and John F. Kennedy that the two were romantically linked. The truth may never be known. Monroe's birthday tribute to Kennedy came just days before her own 36th birthday. She was near the end of her career and her life. Let's return for a minute to the beginning of her career and one of her very first screen appearances at age 22, a bit part in a 1949 film called Love Happy. Monroe was playing opposite none other than Groucho Marx, who remembered the occasion vividly more than 14 years later. But I want to tell you about <laughs> Marilyn Monroe. When we, we did one picture in which she had a bit, she got $100 for one day's work. You can imagine how long ago this was. <clears throat> and uh, Lester Cowan, who was producing the picture, he called me up because I was going to do the scene with Marilyn. He called me up and he said, I wish you'd come over to the studio tomorrow to my office because we're going to try out three girls with a part in, uh, in this picture. I think it was called Love Happy or something. A terrible picture. So uh, I sat there with Lester and uh, the three girls were there. I was introduced to them. And he says, now the first girl, walk. And she walked across from one end to the other. This is very nice. This is now the second girl walk, and she did it too. And then he, the third one. He says, now you walk across. And he says, well, which one uh, do you like the best? I says, you're kidding, aren't you? Now, how can you take anybody except that last girl? Well, the whole room revolved when she walked. Listen. And it was Marilyn Monroe. Yeah. And she got $100. And then we quit shooting at 5 and she got $25 extra for going to a couple of gas stations. They were plugging some kind of gas or something, which was part of the picture or something. And she got $25 extra for, they took snapshots of her from 6 to 8 o'clock. She's a wonderful girl, really. She's a very nice girl. Anything I can do for you? What a ridiculous statement. Mr. Grenion, I want you to help me. I have a little sand left. What seems to be the trouble? Some men are following me. Really? I can't understand why. I advise you to leave. I'll take you down to the bus station. Oh, uh, if I'm not back tonight, go ahead without me. That's been the history of all my romances. Within a few years of her 1949 walk-on with Groucho, Marilyn Monroe was a major star. One of her greatest, most enduring films was 1959's Some Like It Hot, directed by Billy Wilder and co-starring Jack Lemmon and Tony Curtis. One cannot talk about Some Like It Hot without asking about Marilyn Monroe. Was, as legend has it, she always late to the set? Was she uncertain of her lines? Was there take after take after take of each scene? She did a nine o'clock call. 
Sometimes she will show up like, let's say, 11, 13, 12. But they had to be ready, standing there on those high heels, kind of, with the nosebleed. <laughs> and it, 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 it really hurts, you know. It really hurts, you know, to stand. Oh, the, and they had to be ready because at one time we had 83 takes where she had that line, where's where that bourbon? bourbon? Where's that bourbon? Oh, there it she is. She had that one line and she always forgot it. Uh, forgot eight, the draw 83 was times. 83, are you 80, kidding me? I'm not know. kidding you. And she after take 40, I took her to the side and I said, Marilyn, don't worry. And she looked at me and she said, worry about what? <laughs> <laughs> but there was one other line, I don't know if you remember in there. There's one of the few times I've seen a, ma a mind as fast as Billy's really stopped dead. Somewhere in the 50s, one of those takes, and all it was was those seven words. Where is that bourbon? Oh, there it is. That's it. And she kept not getting through it. And Billy gave her at least 500 different ways to do it. All of them were legitimate. I never saw a director come up with so many things. Finally, after trying you know, all of these different things with her, Billy said, all right, now Marilyn, possibly, and she said, don't talk to me now. I'll forget how I want to play it. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I have never well, seen a director stop story, dead uh, like that. Fellow actress and friend, Susan Strasberg, remembers Marilyn when Time and Again continues. In the late 50s, Marilyn Monroe was eager to break free of the dumb blonde sex pot image she had created. She didn't get much help from Hollywood, which saw money to be made in keeping things just the way they were. Marilyn went to New York and spent time studying with legendary acting teacher Lee Strasberg. You may remember him as mobster Hyman Roth in the Godfather films. Monroe grew close to Strasberg and to his daughter Susan, who remembered Marilyn on the Today Show in 1992. It's been uh, 30 years since Marilyn Monroe's death, yet she is arguably more popular today than when she was alive. And when she was alive, she was the quintessential Hollywood icon, the screen's foremost sex symbol. She steamed up the platform in Some Like It Hot. She sang for her supper in Bus Stop. Gentlemen prefer blonde. She stirred things up as a gold-digging temptress. The hand may be quite continental, but diamonds are a girl's best friend. Marilyn Monroe was a Hollywood superstar, but for Susan Strasberg, she was much more than that. In a new book called Marilyn and Me, Strasberg details the depths of Marilyn's personal problems. Marilyn was um, was 12 years your senior, and you were just mm -hmm. 17. 16. 16, when you first met. Just how much did she become a member of, of your family? Well, she became almost like the third adopted child. I, I have a younger brother. Mm -hmm. And she wound up sleeping. She would come over when she was desperate, lonely, or on pills when she needed to be held and sleep. My brother would get kicked into the living room, a couch, and she would sleep uh, in his room. And then we shared a room together at the beach, uh, on our beach house. And what happened was she became almost like a, a child as well as a student of my dad's, who was head of the actor's studio. And she, because she was so much needier than huh. I was, she got a certain kind of attention from him that, of course, I didn't get. Is it fair to say that you resented that? It was fair to say that I was very, very jealous of it. But the strange paradox was that I really liked her because she was so much freer, simpler, very direct than a lot of my friends. She had this kind of innocence and fun. And listen, in a day and age when we were wearing girdles, she talked about sex as if it was something natural and normal. Mm. She was very open, very vulnerable, and in a way she was just as miserable as we all were, and we were adolescents. The time she spent with you, the last, the last eight years of her life, were, were very tough years for her. They were years of affairs, divorces, alcohol, and, 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 and drug dependency. Why, why did her life become such a disaster? You know what, it wasn't such a disaster because at the same time that she was addicted and the same time that some of the relationships were a disaster, and I think it's because she had no self-esteem. So no matter who loves you, if you don't love yourself, it doesn't matter. And she was so desperate for love that not getting it kept throwing her back and back. But on the other hand, she knew in the 50s when very few of us did that the answer to her happiness wasn't out there, it wasn't in furs, it wasn't in a mink, it wasn't in fame. It was inside. And so that at the same time that all this was going on, she really was a very gutsy, courageous lady. She